highest of heights to the depths of the sea. song says you see the depths of my heart and you love me the same romans 5 8 tells us that while we were still sinners christ died for us his mercy is never ending great is your faithfulness great is your faithfulness O god So with the sinner's restless heart, you lead us by still waters into mercy, and nothing can keep us apart. So remember your people, remember your children. Justice 
this God of Jacob. You use the weak to lead the strong. You lead us in the song of your salvation. And all your people sing along. So remember your people. Remember your children. Remember your promise, O oh God. Your grace is enough. Your grace. Welcome to church this morning. Amen. Well, let's continue in, in worship this morning. If uh, the main thing is that you turn your hearts and your, your eyes to Christ this morning, so if you'd like to stand, please feel free. If you become more comfortable, sit, that's okay too.
awestruck wonder at the mention of your name. Jesus, your name is power. Breath and living water. Such a marvelous mystery. Yeah. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Who was and is and is to come. With all creation I sing praise to the King of Kings. You are my everything and I will adore you. I adore
for the saint and for the sinner. Enough for this whole wide world. Your great grace, oh such grace. Oh, 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 Yes, I'm breathing in your grace. Forever I'll be breathing in your grace. And I'm breathing out your praise. Yes, I'm breathing in your grace. Forever I'll be breathing in your grace. And I'm breathing out your praise. Yes, I'm breathing. Yes, I'm breathing in your grace forever, forever. Your grace finds me. Yes, your grace finds me. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. You may be seated. Thank you guys so much. Thank you to uh, Joe. Thank you for the team for uh, leading us in worship this morning. Uh, thank you so much for that. All right, if you have your Bibles this morning, and if you don't, please grab one in the seat back in front of you. Um, turns with me to 1 Timothy chapter number 1. Again, I want to welcome all of our guests that are here today. Thank you so much for being with us. And uh, we would love a record of your visit if you want to fill out that card. Um, and yes, if you want to put the flavor of pie that you would like for me to bring, I will. And I'd just love to get to know you, uh, maybe answer any questions that you may have. And then also, yes, a big wow to our Christmas offering. That is awesome. What a great kickstart to our building program. Um, you may be wondering, you know, what's wrong with what we have. There's nothing wrong with what we have. We are grateful for what we have. Our problem is, is we're running out of room. And we may not be running so much out of room in here as we do have some empty chairs, but we're running out of room in our children's department and our nursery. We're so packed in all three rooms or four rooms, if you will, that uh, we need to expand to give more room for the kids uh, in children's church. So the idea is we need to expand our nursery and we need to expand our children's church department uh, because they are out of room and that's what the offering is going to or the building is going to. So be in prayer about that. We are hoping to start as soon as we can, as soon as we get enough funds to actually break ground. Uh, we're going to be doing that. So we need to do it more sooner than later. So be praying about that uh, and how uh, God would continue to use you and how God can continue to bless this church so we can get that underway. All right. We are continuing in our series. Last time I preached was three weeks ago and uh, I had major surgery and so I wasn't able to be in the pulpit. And I want to thank uh, Jared and Wes for filling in and doing a fine job of preaching the gospel and uh, standing before you guys and giving you the word of God. I hear they did an excellent job. Um, yeah, maybe too good of a job. Uh, so maybe I won't let them come back because I can't let anybody preach better than me. So I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. No, I'm grateful that men can, uh, can give us the word of God. So grateful for them. I can't wait to hear them uh, hear Jared. I didn't get to be here for Jared's preaching, but I got to be here for Wes's. So, but uh, I, I look forward to hearing Jared again. All right. First Timothy chapter number one, we're continuing our series in behavior and belief, God's pattern for the church. We're doing a verse by verse study through the book of First Timothy and Second Timothy. And we're asking questions because I think these questions are very important. And they're questions as is, what is church supposed to be like? Are we doing this right? When we meet and when we gather together, are we doing this right? What does the Bible say? 
Um, what should the local church be doing? What should uh, be the priorities of the local church? How should the local church be ordered and administered? And then how should we relate to one another in the local church? Well, I believe 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and even going into the book of Titus, Paul gives us a clear understanding of what God wants his church as far as behavior and belief and his pattern for the church. And so that is why I'm bringing you this series, um, which will be for the next several months um, here to you guys, because I think this is very important. Now, three weeks ago when I preached, we looked at three models of how church is done. You'll remember I talked about the liberal church. Now, the liberal church is a church, and I don't want to go into all of these in detail, but just kind of highlight. Remember, the liberal church um, changes the message of the gospel because in the liberal church, the message of the gospel is very offensive. So usually in a liberal church, you won't see crosses. Um, they don't mention the blood of Jesus. Um, they won't mention commitment, discipleship, repentance, big words, um, but, but with great meaning. And so they believe that because the gospel message is so offensive and not palatable, they don't talk about it or they change it because for the fact that they want to make it the message that they have more palatable to those who are in the building. And again, all three of these models of churches, they all have uh, one thing that they really focus on, and that is in the liberal church, they focus on unbelievers. Now, again, you got to go back and listen to my message three weeks ago, and you'll understand that here at Lighthouse Bible Church, we want unbelievers to be here. Amen, Christians? We want unbelievers to be here. We want atheists to fill the seats. We want people who are agnostics to come in here. We want people who don't know God to come in here because we want them to know who God is, right? We want to share with them the gospel message of Jesus Christ. But when it comes to a church, what is a church really supposed to be for, and what does a church do? Well, again, there's the liberal church and their focus is on non-believers. We talked about the modern church that we see in the Western culture. If you do a study of churches here in America, we call it the Western <coughs> culture, you'll find the modern church. Now, the modern church doesn't change the message of the gospel, but the modern church believes that the message of the gospel is outdated, that it's old. And so what a modern church will do is they'll do things in their methods a little bit differently or more of a worldly atmosphere, if you will, to make the gospel message more palatable. They try to make the message more acceptable by making their methods more attractional. And so the modern church will do everything attractional to get people to stay, to get them attracted to Jesus. Um, and you have to be careful with there. Uh, you have to be careful with that because whatever you use to attract people to Jesus or attract people to the church, you've got to continue to do to keep them coming. And some of you raise nodding your heads, and some of you are like, what do you mean by that? If I bring secular music into this congregation, let's say I decided that we're going to play some Aerosmith and some ACDC and some Bob Seger. Um, uh, maybe we're going to do some country. We're going to bring Randy Travis. Is that Randy Travis? Yeah. And... Uh, um, and I can't remember the other guy. But anyways, uh, we bring that kind of music in here. And uh, yeah, Joe's doing his light on his phone. So, yeah. And so we do that and we do. Now, the whole purpose of bringing secular music in here is to get the people excited about, hey, did you hear it? Lighthouse, man, they're rocking it over there. They're playing ACDC's Highway to Hell, man. You've got to go check it out. And everybody comes in and, you know, we're up here jamming out to this rock music. And pe all the people that come in that are unbelievers are like, yeah, this is awesome. This is my kind of church. This is what I want to be in. Now, the problem with that is that I'm going to have to continue to do more ACDC and, and Van Halen and all that stuff to keep them interested in continuing to come. Are you with me? But you have to ask yourself, is that really what God wants for his church? Okay, so what we have to do is, again, the reason why I'm teaching you this is so that we can see through God's word what, what does God want. What is God's pattern for the church. And then, of course, their focus, of course, is in unbelievers. But then the biblical church, that if you study the New Testament and, and you look at how did God design the church and what was the church designed for? The church was designed for believers. Matter of fact, it's believers that make up the church. Are you with me? 
We all know that. I'm, uh, some of you are seasoned Christians. You know that we who are believers in Christ, we make up the body of Christ. We are the church. Now, that's not to say that unbelievers aren't welcome here. Are you with me? Okay, so just so we understand each other, people are going, oh man, Tim doesn't want, no, I want unbelievers to come. But the biblical model of the church, when God instituted the church through Christ, it was for believers. When you read all of the New Testament writings of Paul, of John, <coughs> of, uh, 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 um, <laughs> my mind's going blank, and, and you read all these, of Luke, uh, um, you read these and you find that every single one of these letters, we call books, we call them letters, epistles, were written to the church or written to Christians who are the church. These letters were never written to unbelievers. They were never written to those who are atheists. They never were written to people who are agnostics. But it was written to those who are Christians, okay? And so therefore, on that basis, the biblical church's focus has always been on believers. Now, now stay with me. I don't want to be belabor in this because I've only got just a few more minutes. My wife told me, she says, Tim, you haven't been in the pulpit in three weeks. I already know it's going to be a long Sunday. Please keep it short. So I'm going to try. But the biblical church's focus was always on believers. As you read the epistles, as you read all the way through Acts to Revelation, you'll find that the emphasis, everything, all the teaching was on the church, the church, the church, the church. Believers, get right with God. Believers, stop doing this. Believers, start doing this. Love one another. Encourage one another. Strengthen one another. Pray for one another. Do all of these things as the body of Christ. Corinthians, great chapter, 12, 13, and 14. The gifts of the church. The gifts to the believers from the Holy Spirit. But it's all designed for the body of Christ. The church is designed for the body of Christ for what? For encouragement. We're going to talk a little bit about today. For encouragement, for edification, for doctrine, so that as I as the pastor teach you, indoctrinate you, encourage you, and strengthen you through the Word of God, you then go and do what Jesus told us to do in Matthew 28, 19. Go therefore and make disciples, right? And in Matthew 15, where he said, go and preach the gospel. So as you are being taught and being discipled as the body of Christ, you grow in maturity in Christ, and then you go out and you do the work of Christ. Are you with me? Yeah. That's why the biblical church model has always been to believers. Again, that's not to say that unbelievers don't count or they're not. No, no, no. We want unbelievers to be here because it, in, in every message we preach, we preach Jesus, right? And we want them to come to Christ, okay? So in the biblical church that we find here, as Paul talks to Timothy and even in Titus, we find here the attributes of a biblical church. And one of the attributes of a biblical church is doctrine. So look with me, 1 Timothy chapter number 1. We'll look at verses 3 through verse number 11. Notice what he says. Paul tells young Timothy, he says, As I urged you, when I went into Macedonia, remain in Ephesus that you may charge some that they teach no other doctrine nor give heed to fables and endless genealogies which cause disputes or arguments rather than godly edification which is in the faith. Now the purpose of the commandment is love from a pure heart, from a good conscience, and from a sincere faith from which some, having strayed, have turned aside to idle talk, desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor the things which they affirm. But we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully, knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous person, but for the lawless and insubordinate, for the ungodly and for the sinners, for the unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslayers, for fornicators, for sodomites, for kidnappers, for liars, for perjurers, and if there is any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God which was committed to my trust. Now I want you to think about something. What is doctrine? Because here Paul's talking about doctrine is important. What is doctrine? Doctrine is simply teaching. 
That's what it is. Doctrine is simply teaching. Doctrine is teaching from God about God that directs us to the glory of God. Listen again. Doctrine is teaching from God, here in the Bible, about God, which leads us or directs us to the glory of God. Now, with that being said, doctrine, we ask ourselves, is it really that important? Well, yes, doctrine is extremely important. Now, I'm going to use the word sound doctrine. I'm going to use the word biblical doctrine and, or healthy doctrine. They all mean the same. Okay, and I'm meaning doctrine that is taught out of the Word of God, okay? So when we look at that, we ask ourselves, well, is doctrine really that important? Well, it's extremely important, very, very important. As a matter of fact, we can find that Paul tells Timothy in 1 Timothy 4, 16, he says this. He said, take heed, take heed to yourself and to doctrine, Continue in them, for in doing this, you will save both yourself and those who hear you. As a matter of fact, in the same book, chapter 6, verse 20, he says this, O Timothy, guard, guard what was committed to your trust. What was committed to Timothy's trust? Doctrine, biblical doctrine. Avoiding, listen to what he says, avoiding the profane and idle babblings and contradictions of what is called knowledge. Now notice with me in your notes, there's several passages here. Turn with me to 2 Timothy. We're going to look at these real quick. And again, I told you, make sure you bring your Bible. You're going to want to highlight, underline, because this will be good for you. And I believe that it's very important that I as a pastor and any pastor, I believe that we should give you the Bible. I believe that we should saturate you with the Word of God. We should be pouring out the Bible verse by verse and getting you the Word of God because I believe that's what pastors, according to the Word of God, ought to do. But notice with me, 2 Timothy chapter number 1, verse number 13, and Paul says, Hold fast the pattern of sound words which you have heard from me in faith and love and uh, which are in Christ Jesus. Same chapter, look at chapter number 2, or I mean same book, chapter 2, look at verses 1 and to. He says, you therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus and the things that you have heard from me among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Look at same chapter, verse 15 through 18. Paul says, be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. But shun profane and idle babblings, for they will increase to more ungodliness, and their message will spread like cancer. Hymenius and Philatris are of this sort, who have strayed concerning the truth. They've strayed concerning the truth, saying that the resurrection is already past, and they overthrow the faith of some. That's a false doctrine that they were teaching, that the resurrection has already happened, that Jesus has already came uh, uh, in, in the rapture, and that's not the case. That was false doctrine. Look at chapter 3, verse 14. Notice what he says. He says, but you must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of. Continue in that doctrine, knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. And look at uh, chapter number 4, verses 1 through 4. Paul says, I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word, preach sound doctrine, preach what God has said in his word, thus says the Lord. Preach the word of God, be ready in season and out of season, convince, rebuke, exhort with all longsuffering and teaching, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine or biblical teaching, there's that word doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers and they will turn their ears away from the what? The truth and be turned aside to what? Fables. Yes, doctrine is very important. And Paul emphasized to Timothy, this is so important, I want you to heed it, grab a hold of it, guard it with your life, and preach it to the church. Teach it 
to the church. And because right doctrine is extremely important, notice what Paul tells Timothy back in chapter 1 of 1 Timothy. Notice what Paul tells Timothy in verse number 3. He says, doctrine is so important, I want you as a pastor. Command those who are teaching false doctrine to stop. Notice what he says, verse 3, is he says, I urged you when I went to Macedonia, remain in Ephesus. So Timothy's at the church of Ephesus, and he's the elder, he's the pastor there, along with the other leaders in the church. And Paul tells Timothy, he says, I want you, and I'm charging you, that you tell some, in verse number uh, uh, 3, charge some that they teach no other doctrine. Paul's telling Timothy, I'm telling you to command those who are in the church, who are teaching fables and genealogies and this false doctrine, tell them to stop. That is your responsibility as a pastor. S make them stop what they are teaching. In verse number four, he says, nor give heed to fables and endless genealogies. Why? Because they cause disputes rather than godly edification, which is in the faith. Now, he tells him to command to, to, to stop this. And, and I'll be honest with you, you know, as a pastor of this church, um, I, I say this, I, I have people that um, want to teach Bible studies, and I'm all for it. We got Jordan Hunt teaching a men's Bible study on Thursday nights, and I hope you guys will come to that. And I don't know if, is it too late? Can guys still come to your Bible study, or is it like a close, only a select group can only, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Uh, yes, please come. And uh, he's got a Bible study. We have ladies' Bible studies that are uh, uh, that happen and, and time to time to time. Matter of fact, uh, two of them just ended, and uh, so I'm sure we'll have more come up. But here's the thing: I always want to know as a pastor what's being taught in this church. Now you say, now what, what business is that of yours? Well, it's all my business of what's being taught in this church because Paul told Timothy, make sure you know who's teaching and what they're teaching in the church. And I don't, I don't, listen, I don't say it to be like boastful or arrogant or man, you're a dictator. No, 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 you don't understand. I would love it if all you men taught a Bible study and all you women taught about, I'd be like, yeah, that's great. But here's the thing. I want to know what's being taught because it is my responsibility as God has placed me here as a pastor to make sure that people aren't teaching false doctrine. And why is that so important? Why is it important that right doctrine is being taught? And here's why. Because of the problems that false doctrine does. It's, it's so important. Listen, let me give you three things that Paul tells us right here. Three negative effects of false doctrine. You ready? Here they are. Number one, false doctrine causes disunity in the church. False doctrine causes disunity. As he said in verse 4, he said, Nor give heed to fables and to endless genealogies which cause disputes. The word disputes means arguments. Have you ever been in a church where people argue? How many of you loved that church? Right? Nobody loves going to church and you've got an argumentative person. Have you ever met an argumentative person? They love to argue. They love to debate. And they just do it just to cause argument. Are you with me? Right? And, and, and here, Paul tells Timothy, he says, here's the problem. When you have people that are teaching false doctrine in the church, he goes, what that does is all that does is bring arguments. It brings disputes into the body of Christ. And here's the thing. When you've got two people that are arguing and you've got two people that are disputing one with another and they're doing this, there's no unity. Are you with me? You cannot have unity in the church if you have two people that are going head to head disputing and arguing over something that does not matter. Because there are some things that people argue about in church that just don't matter. Now, that's not to say that there aren't things that do matter and need to be, should I say, I don't know if I want to use the word debated, but it needs to be addressed and addressed head on. And I'll talk about that here in just a minute. But in some false doctrines or teachings that was happening here at the church of Ephesus, some of it was just silly. And it had nothing to do with the truth of the word of God. Matter of fact, look with me in chapter 6. Disputes cause, disun cause disunity. Chapter 6 of, of this book, verse number 3. Notice what Paul said. He said, If anyone teaches otherwise and does not consent to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which accords with godliness, what? He is proud. 
He knows nothing, but is obsessed with disputes. You ever met somebody that's obsessed with arguing? He's obsessed with disputes and arguments over words from which come envy, strife, reveling, evil suspicions, useless wranglings. And by the way, the, the phrase there, useless wranglings, means continuous arguing. They just, they just want to keep bringing it up and bringing it up. They want to fight. They want to argue. They want to argue. They want to argue. He says, of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth who suppose that godliness is a means of gain. In other words, they're teaching a doctrine here one of the doctors there teaches like, hey, listen, if you're right with God, you're going to be blessed financially. And God blesses you financially by your standing of how godly you are. So the more godly you are, the more richer you are. <coughs> That's not even in the Bible. Are you with me? He says, from such withdraw yourself. From such withdraw yourself. 2 Timothy 2.23 says, but avoid foolish and ignorant disputes. Why? Knowing that they generate strife. What are ignorant and, and, and disputes? What are ignorant disputes and, and of foolish and ignorant disputes? For instance, Christmas. Should we celebrate Christmas, Pastor? We shouldn't celebrate Christmas because celebrating Christmas is a, you're worshiping other gods and, and that's a pagan holiday. And pastor, we should, and then all of a sudden these people that want to argue and dispute this will go to you and go to different, hey, what do you think? Pastor says we ought to celebrate Christmas, but we ought to celebrate Christmas because when you put up a Christmas tree, you're worshiping the God of the woods and the devil and, and all this stuff. And, 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 and listen, you just, we just got to stay away because it's pagan and all this. And I'm like, don't be a goober, <laughs> right? Come on, really? But people are hung up on stuff like that. Come on. People are hung up on that. It's like, well, well, we shouldn't celebrate Christmas because Jesus wasn't born on December 25th. It's more likely he was born in April or August. <laughs> so? Okay. Let's do Christmas in August. Let's have three Christmases. I'm all for the presents. <laughs> but the point is, is that people can get into foolish and ignorant disputes, all because, here's the problem, all because they want to dispute it. They want to argue. And every time you do stuff like that, all you do is cause friction and disunity in the church. That's all you do. And that's why false doctrine, and by the way, false doctrine just isn't teaching or turning, uh, and I'll, I'll say two different types of teaching. There's teaching where people teach things that have nothing to do with the Word of God. They have nothing to do with God. They have nothing to do with Christ. Uh, you know, some of the things that want to debate, you know, people debate things like, you know, well, if God's so big, can he create a rock that he can't pick up? Well, that's a good debate. Well, let's talk about that. It's like, <laughs> it's not important. But people will debate that and argue that. <clears throat> and so you have those types of teachings. But then you have the teaching that actually changes the truth of the word of God. And that's false teaching. So you have both of those types of teachings, which are false teachings. So, number one, false doctrine causes disunity in the church. Number two, false doctrine, listen, false doctrine turns people away from the truth. Look at verse number six. He says, uh, as a matter of fact, in verse five, he says, now the purpose of the commandment, we'll get into this probably next Sunday, because uh, I'm already out of time. My wife's, you know, probably going, oh, he's still going. Uh, now the purpose of the commandment is love from a pure heart, from a good conscience, from a sincere faith, from which some... From which some, having strayed, they strayed away, they turned away, have turned aside, have turned aside to idle talk. You see, false doctrine turns people away from the truth. Matter of fact, Paul even told the church at Ephesus and he told the elders, look with me in Acts chapter number 20. Turn back to the left. Acts 20. Um, and look what Paul says in verse number 17. He warns the elders of this same church that, Peter, or that uh, Timothy is at. Acts 20. Look at verse number 17. And Paul says this. So, Paul is, uh, in Miletus, he sends to Ephesus and he calls for the elders of the church. Verse 18. And when they had come to him, he said to them, You know from the first day that I came to Asia and what manner I always lived among you, 
serving the Lord with all humility, with many tears and trials, which happened to me by the plotting of the Jews, how I kept back nothing that was helpful, but proclaimed it to you and taught you publicly and from house to house, testifying to the Jews and also to Greeks repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. And see, now I go bound in the Spirit to Jerusalem, not knowing the things which will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies in every city, saying that chains and tribulations await me. But none of these things really move me, nor do I count my life dear to myself, so that I may finish my race with joy and the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. And indeed now I know that you all, among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God, I've, I've taught you sound doctrine, which see my, will see my face no more. Therefore I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all men. In other words, Paul is saying, I have not... I'm not guilty of not preaching to you, Jesus. I've done that. I've preached the blood. I've showed you the way of salvation. I've showed you the truth of God's word, all of these things. I am not guilty of any man because I've shown you and preached the whole counsel of God. He said, For I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. Verse 28, Therefore, notice what he says now, Take heed to yourselves and to all the flock, the flock is you, the flock is the body of Christ, among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. For I know this, now this is Paul saying, for I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also from among yourselves, men will rise up, speaking perverse things, to draw away the disciples after themselves. Have you ever heard of a church or been a part of a church where someone in the congregation split the church or tried to get people to follow his way and not the pastor's way? Anybody? Okay. And Paul says it's going to happen. You take heed. You're the shepherds. You're the shepherds of the flock. You are the bulldogs, if you will. The sheep dogs. He says, wolves, savage wolves will come in you, not sparing the flock. They will turn away the disciples after themselves. Verse 31, therefore watch and remember that for three years I did not cease to warn everyone night and day with tears. Paul even warned the church at Ephesus, going back to chapter number one of 1 Timothy, that this was going to happen, that people would be turned away from the truth. Matter of fact, when you look at all of this, and we'll close here, but in 1 Timothy of this book, and you look at chapter 4, and you look at verse number 1, and Paul even told Timothy, now the Spirit expressly says that in latter times, some will depart from the faith, and they'll give heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry, and commanding to abstain from foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. In other words, there's these false teachers saying, hey, you can't eat that, you can't eat that, you can't eat that, that's wrong, that's wrong, that's wrong. Hey, you can't be married, you can't do this, you can't. And they go outside the truth of the Word of God, and they're teaching things that God says is okay to eat. Thank God we get to eat pork ribs, amen. Because <laughs> I love barbecue. He says, for every creature of God is good and nothing is to be refused if it is received with thanksgiving. Look at chapter 6, same book, chapter 6. Look at verse number 3. We're almost done, we're almost done. Hang with me. Chapter 6, verse 3, he says, if anyone teaches otherwise, we've read through that. He is what? He is proud, knowing nothing, obsessed with disputes. But notice with me in verse number 20. Same chapter, verse 20 says, O Timothy, guard what was committed to your trust, avoiding the profane and idle babblings and contradictions of what is falsely called knowledge or doctrine. He said, by professing it, some have strayed concerning the faith. Grace be with you. Amen. Look at 2 Timothy chapter number 3. Look at verse number 1. But know this, that in the last days perilous times will come, for men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boast, boy, lovers of money. Turn on the TV preachers, right? And you see it. By the way, I'll get into this next Sunday, but false doctrine, and I'll be talking a lot about this and, and what you have to be careful of, but when I had my surgery and I'm laying in the hospital, and this was Sunday, so um, you guys are here having church, and, and I'm like, okay, so I'm going to thumb through the 
thing and I'm going to try to find me a TV preacher. And, and I got up, of course, I got up every two hours because you couldn't help it because the nurses come in there every two hours, you know. And they're poking you or jabbing you. Hey, are you okay? Well, I was until you woke me. But anyways, it was, I don't know, 3 o'clock, 4 o'clock in the morning. I turn on the TV. I said, well, let me see if I can get some preaching on there and I'll have church here. And, and, here, and I've got the video on my phone. I wish I could get it up on the screen, but I don't know how. But um, if you want to see it, I'll show it to you. But there's a guy on there. And uh, he began to talk about, he's got this little, like a ketchup envelope, you know, the ketchup envelope you get from Burger King, and it's filled with healing water, and, and spring, natural spring water, healing water, anointing water, he says, and if you'll take this and do what he says, God will bless you financially. And all of a sudden, he's got all these people that are coming, uh, God blessed me with $25,000 when I used that spring anointed water, and person after person, God increased me $250,000 when I used the spring water. And the more I'm watching it, the more comical, but the more mad I'm getting. People, that is so wrong. That's not even Bible. That is not even true. And people are getting sucked up into this false false doctrine and this false teaching. Why? Because people who are desperate and hurting and struggling go, oh, well, if that's true, well, I've got my last hundred bucks. What can it hurt? Let me do this and maybe I'll get, you know, a thousand dollars. And that's what false teachers prey on. They prey on the hurting and the down and they prey on those who are, uh, are struggling and, and those who are, are needful. And you have to be careful. Don't fall into the trap of false doctrine and false teaching because it's turning you away from what's really true. Are you with me? Okay, let me, let me close with this, okay? Let me finish closing with this. So he says here in, in 2 Timothy chapter, uh, uh, where was I? Chapter number three, he says, there are going to be lovers of money, uh, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power. Having a form of Christianity, yeah, they're, oh man, that TV preacher, man, he looks good, he dresses fancy, got a sharp suit, he drives a $95 million jet, man, he's got to be right with God, he carries a big Bible and it's a King James version, so you have the these and the thuses and all this and that, and he must be right with God, and oh man, I'm going to, yes, I've got it. He may have an outward appearance of being a Christian, but on the inside, he denies the power of God. And he says, and from such people, what? Turn away. And then in chapter 4, we find that the same scriptures that we read before. By the way, verse 13, but evil men and imposters of chapter 3 will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. I'm going to stop here because I'm out of time and I'm only a quarter way through my message. Um, I had no idea it was going to take this long. And uh, I'm, I just uh, I apologize. But if you'll come next Sunday, I'll finish this message. And I hope that you'll be a part of this because it is so important that you as believers understand true doctrine, right doctrine, biblical doctrine, healthy doctrine. Why is that so important? Because so many people are being turned away from the truth and are believing some weird things when none of it's in the Bible. Now, you may be here this morning, and please, I'm not here to offend you. I'm not here to, you know, uh, if you believe in different things, I'm not here to make fun of you. I'm not here to browbeat you. I'm not here to condemn you. I'm not here to any of those things. But what I am here to do is to tell you the truth. And I want to show you the truth. And in showing you the truth, maybe you'll see that the false doctrines that you believe are a lie and that are turning you away from what's really important and what really is important next week we're going to find that paul tells timothy there's two things that are so important when it comes to teaching sound doctrine that people are missing we're missing the two most important things that are to be there when people are teaching and preaching the word of god two important things you'll find them right there in chapter number one in the verses that we just read and i pray that you'll come back next sunday and you'll see what those two most important things are Please don't miss it. Let me ask you this morning. I'm going to leave you with this sound doctrine bite here. The Bible teaches and Jesus said, no man can come to the Father but by me. Jesus said in John 14, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father 
But by me, that's true doctrine. Jesus said it out of his own mouth. Those are his own words. Here's true doctrine. Nothing will get you into the kingdom of heaven but Jesus and Jesus alone. It's only by the grace of God, Ephesians 2, 8, that we are saved. It's not of works. We can't do good enough. We can't go to church enough. We can't give enough. We can't do anything enough to ever get us into the kingdom of heaven. It's the grace of God. That's it. It's a grace of God. Not of works so that we can't boast. That's true doctrine. That comes right out of the Word of God. So my question to you is this morning, all of you, some of you I know, some of you I don't know, have you relied on that true doctrine? Or are you still believing a false doctrine that tells you that there are many ways to God? Or tells you that if you're a good person, you can get to God? Or tells you that if your parents pray enough for you, you can get to God? Listen to me. That is false doctrine, not true doctrine. The true doctrine and right doctrine is what Jesus said. So have you made Jesus your Savior? Have you understood that you yourself, which by the way, we're going to talk about the law, the commandments that he says there. In chapter, all this is so good, I wish we could stay here another hour. Because it's so good. Not my preaching, but the word. I'm just saying, it's just like there's so much there. That the law was given to us so that we could see that we were sinners. That you're a sinner. I'm a sinner. And we've all done wrong before God. And you've got to see that and admit that. That you're not a good person. I'm not a good person. You're not a good person. And when you understand that, you'll know that Jesus, who is very good, gave his life for us who are not good. And when he did that, that when we who are not good receive him who is good, we take upon the righteousness of Christ and we become good. Children of God. So if you've never made that statement of faith, if you've never professed Christ, if you've never received him as your Savior, the only one that can forgive you of your sins, the only one that can redeem you, the only one that can wash away all the yuck that you've done in your life, then I want to encourage you to do that today. I want to encourage you to call upon Christ to save you. I want to encourage you to recognize and acknowledge that you're a sinner and that only Jesus Christ can save you and that only He can redeem you and give you eternal life. So would you bow your heads?